All right, everyone, welcome to uh, our next installment of uh, Don't Panic, Let's Talk, a series that we're doing with, in uh, partnership with Grasshopper Bank. Uh, my name is Andy Saldana. I am the Executive Director for New York Tech Alliance. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, organization here in New York City that work to create an equitable and accessible tech industry uh, ecosystem for all. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, it's uh, been a crazy uh, week and a half, um, new developments all over the place. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge uh, that uh, and thank you for, for giving us your time today uh, during a, a crazy, crazy environment. Um, I know that I've been working really hard to keep uh, a regular work pace um, in light of all of the events that have hap been happening in the world um, and it's been impacting my uh, well-being and just how I'm thinking about uh, lots of things. So I imagine that it's also affecting a number of you. Um, with that, you know, thank you again for giving us your time today. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through a few thank yous. We have a wonderful presenter. Um, uh, Miha will be moderating. Julia uh, from Milk Run will be um, our guest today. Uh, she's Amazing, I listened to your TED Talk probably like three times. It's phenomenal. Um, so we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, before that, just a few quick announcements and thank yous as usual, um, and then we'll get right to it. Um, first up, I just wanna say thank you to all of uh, our um, annual partners that make what we do uh, possible. Um, everybody from Xander to Grasshopper to CEO's right hand to with them. Uh, they're great partners in the ecosystem uh, and are really fantastic uh, assets um, and resources for anybody uh, who's a founder or creating startup uh, entrepreneur looking for access to resources, fantastic uh, brands to connect with. Um, if you wanna learn more about us as an organization, uh, please check us out. Our website is nytech.org um, and um, my email is andy at nytech.org. Um, Again, special thank you to Grasshopper Bank for helping us put the series together. Um, they've been a fantastic partner during this uh, COVID time um, and before. Um, fantastic uh, bank serving founders at companies supporting the innovation ecosystem. Check them out at grasshopper.bank. And then our next events uh, coming up, we, on Tuesday, June the 9th, we have uh, New York Tech Latinas presenting their second edition of Latina Luminaries. Um, we are gonna have Jessica Santana from America on Tech uh, on Instagram Live for about 30 minutes, being interviewed by one of our board members, Ivan de la Pena. Fantastic, great, ask me anything kind of session. Encourage you to follow us on uh, Instagram at NY Tech Meetup um, and participate in that session on Tuesday. Um, on Thursday, June 11th, we'll be doing a, um, our next edition of Startup Financing Forum. Um, this is a uh, hour-long panel conversation. Uh, this event will be focused on um, uh, venture alternatives, venture debt as an alternative. Um, so I encourage you uh, to check that out as well. And then on Tuesday, June 30th, um, we will be doing our uh, develop, Developing Pride event in, in uh, partnership with Queer Tech. Um, and it's a celebration of LGBTQ plus in tech. So I encourage you to check out all of our events. Uh, you can always find them at nytech.org. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, we have a very uh, special uh, edition today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Miha from Grasshopper. Uh, Miha, take it away. Thanks, Andy. Uh, hi, Julia, it's always good to see you. Hi, Miha, great to see you too. And thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, just as a general reminder of what we do in these sessions, they are, they are uh, by design small so that we can get a lot of interaction from people to ask questions um, and get everything out of what they need. They can get everything out of it uh, over the course of the next hour. Um, Julie and I will have a conversation and, and we'll talk about some things. I've got questions that have come in from participants um, and also have some ideas around um, other things that I'd love to talk about. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the time has driven a lot of the conversation and we certainly will spend some time talking about that. Um, but the general idea of these is always to keep them as positive as possible and talk about good things that have happened and, um, and how we're able to, to sort of persevere in this time. 
So, uh, so feel free at any point to either go on video and raise your hand or use the raise hand button um, or come off of uh, mute and uh, ask your question. Um, these are recorded, so I uh, do want to make sure that everybody knows that. Um, if you want to ask me a question that you don't want to, you want to ask, ask it privately, you can do it in the chat or do it to Andy in the chat, and we'll make sure that it gets, gets connected to you. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to, to introduce Julia, um, who I'm going to ask, because I ask everybody to do two things as, as part of introduction. Uh, one is, is to tell us about your business, what it is, what does it do, uh, what do you love about it? Um, and then secondarily, talk about how you got into it. What's your story? Uh, where did you come from before you got there? And why, why this, why now? Great. Uh, well, so I'm the CEO and founder of Milk Run, and really it is our goal to create a platform where farmers can go online, list their products, uh, and then we help them with delivery and distribution direct to consumers' homes, restaurants, or other schools and institutions. So in, in short, an online platform for people to buy great food from really great farmers locally. And how I got into the business, um, I'm really not from the, the world of agriculture at all. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And um, kind of before this, what I was doing was I was working for B2B, a B2B media company for Penton Media. It was my job to take 172 of their trade publications digital. So I, I, I always reflect on that and thinking about what I've always loved and it's kind of taking these older industries and helping innovate within them and helping, I guess, being a witness to how quickly even large industries like publishing media could change overnight, what it felt like. Um, and so I was working a lot with other customers, with other of our kind of top tier clients at that time, people like DuPont, Monsanto, Syngenta, um, all the way to Natural Products Expo, John Deere, across all of our different markets and helping really report what was kind of consumer demand driving B2B decisions for sustainability and transparency. So kind of working on a very high level. Um, and when I moved out to the West Coast, Portland, Oregon, it was my intention at that time, I figured I would land in either San Francisco or Seattle. So this was kind of my, my in-between to, to figure out where it exactly was I, w I wanted to continue to live and pursue my career. And I met a group of chefs who were moving up from San Francisco, kind of well-known farm-to-table chefs who were starting a farm here in Portland, very Portlandia style. Um, and they were starting a restaurant and they were going to grow and raise all of the ingredients that they would serve there. So I kind of call it like my quarter life, mid or my quarter life crisis, if you will. Um, my day job looked very different from what my weekends began to look like with learning what it was to, to be a farmer, to start a farm. Um, everything that went along with that. And it was about six months after me probably stepping foot on the farm for the first time where I ended up quitting my job um, and becoming a farmer full time. Um, and for like for the love of food, just this whole new world, this passionate world of people who literally were just completely dedicated to their craft and their art and their feeding their community. Um, and it wasn't, wasn't too long before I also realized the harsh realities of being a small farmer um, today and what that meant and you know having to find customers clients having to drive your goods into town every day right like I quickly learned that farming is essentially well it's fencing a lot of fencing or driving you're spending all of your time uh, on the road finding customers and we were a group of young people who were just getting into this and you know and the more and more I got to look at the full landscape of our local food system our national food system you know, I started seeing huge trends like we have an aging population of farmers right so 85% of our farmers are over 65 years old and just like the actual actions of driving all the time of finding customers they, that gets weary in a way um, and also kind of confronting how do you scale a farm? How do you find enough customers? How do you track what you have? How do you price your goods? All of these problems kept plaguing me at night. And I wanted to, I guess, get my hands a little bit more dirty uh, with just farming. I wasn't a very good farmer, as it turns out. Uh, but where I could apply a lot of my knowledge and my passion was more on the, the business area, with whether that's marketing for our products, finding customers, and then also 
kind of struggling with this question that we have here at Milk Run, which is in our supply chains, if the, the challenge is distribution. So how do we actually get more goods into market? How do we make it easier? How do we drive efficiency when it comes to the actual act of driving goods from a farm to the people who want it? And for me, when I saw kind of how online grocery habits are shifting and changing and what that whole grocery buying landscape looks like for us as modern consumers, that became this, this moment of opportunity for us, I think, um, kind of bringing back that original distribution model, like the milkman, like that's what we all want now. And um, so seeing the power of actually direct buying from farms and wanting them to directly deliver their goods to you at home, I mean, I just became pretty obsessed with that notion. And um, I don't know if I also mentioned this because it's very relevant to our time, but through the process of me becoming a farmer, uh, I actually purchased with my now husband a USDA meat processing facility. So one of the last independ independently owned meat processing facilities left in our country. Um, and that became kind of a huge supply chain that I'm personally very passionate about, which was for our ranchers and, um, and livestock here. And being able to buy grass-fed or regeneratively raised um, meat. And how, how can we continue to do that? So I literally bought a truck off Craigslist, a refrigerated van. And it was my, I was the number one truck driver. That was my job um, to to or, or take orders from chefs from our meat shop. And then I would be in charge of driving it into the city. And I mean, from that agri natural aggregation point, just seeing the value for these ranchers, right? They were like, oh great, I can bring it to your facility. You'll, I can, you can have it butchered and you'll drive it in like, you'll just simply drive it to the restaurants. Seeing that change alone was incredibly inspiring. So I started then opening up that channel to homes and neighborhoods around the restaurants that I was already driving to. And then other farmers started calling and asking me if I could go pick up their goods too and drive them into the city. And that was really how Milk Run got its start. And that was about two years ago now. It was just over two years ago. That's awesome. And when you started the business, um, you obviously knew nothing about, uh, and, and, and this is, this is also a, a tech enabled platform, right? The idea is that there's a, there's a website where I can go in and select the things I want delivered. Um, and then those things get delivered. Um, when you started the business, um, how is it, how is it taken when, well, you start the business, it starts to go along you decide that you want to grow the business and you start talking to investors and other folks out in the world how is it taken what was the reaction from the investment community uh, to this idea of getting farms delivered to people the first vc i ever yeah vc i ever sat down with um talked about this idea with said that's the worst idea i've ever heard Nobody really cares where their food comes from, and nobody's ever going to want to buy directly from a farmer in a way that you could ever make money or scale. Um, so my response to him was, do you want to be a customer? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, actually I do. And so happy to report, he's still an incredibly happy customer and one of our most active customers actually now. Um, and I think that, I mean, that story itself really was a lot of that journey, right? I mean, for me, when it comes to trying to talk to investors um, that have access to the kind of capital that we need to change our food system, um, it was, it's been a hard story. It's, and I think that's largely driven by a few things. One is, you know, kind of the food delivery world and the bucket that we get put in there um, has gone through many phases and shifts and, um, I guess some, some would perceive a lot of failures and businesses that have struggled to really make money, right? Become profitable from an actual unit economics perspective. So there's a lot of doubt around um, the viability of, of distribution to consumers direct from, from food sources. And then the other, the other thing that I think played a big role, at least in, you know, far in the farming world is when you're talking to venture capitalists on the West Coast or investors, it's very, or, you know, very technology driven. When I'm talking to them about small farms, I, even using the word small, I've learned is something I have to shy away from because they really look at this as a niche, niche, small, maybe like crunchy granola driven, um, yes, market sector that really doesn't have a ton of scalability or viability for the long term. And so a lot of education is needed 
around how large these markets can be and how much, um, I guess disruption is a, not my favorite word, but if you think about it in this world, it's how we can innovate, how we can really bring innovation to some of these models that haven't changed since the 1960s. And so you're, you're facing headwinds as you're going out to build the business. You do raise some money, right? Like, like you, get, you get a little bit of help from some, from some good folks. Yeah. And, um, but you're talking to people and you're getting told small business, niche business, never going to be big. Um, you know, potentially you're wasting your time putting this much effort into it. How did you persevere? Like what, what in you kept you going? Well, I think, you know, the world of food is, even in times like this, right? It's like to turn to the tangible, like to have food that we deliver, to see like the, the beauty of, of the vegetables that we have, they're directly handed to you by farmers. Like your job is to put that into a box and then bring it to a family that's like eagerly waiting for you on their doorstep when you arrive, like just delivering that customer experience, which was my job. So being able to have that is where I spent, you know, 10 hours of my day doing. Um, I think it always goes back to that, even now, even today. It's like, we ultimately get to bring good food to people and joy and happiness. And like when I get emails that say like, I've had Revel Meat Company's bacon and I could never have bacon again, or Grano bake, you know, Grano sourdough bread is the best thing I've ever had. Um, just remembering that like, we're building a company for customers and we're building a company that helps truly like bring people fresher, higher quality food. And that's what we got to do every day. So I guess just, just seeing that and the validation, changing where you need validation from, um, or not, yeah, is I think still as incredibly important as it, ever, as it was in day one. Um, and then we were farmer funded. You know, our first checks came from our, far, our farmers themselves. So to see that they were really buying in, you know, also helped. And then other founders in the community who are customers, even from the tech world, you know, people who'd run and, and scaled billion dollar tech companies, um, you know, came on as angel investors. So being able to actually bridge all of these things every day gave me a, a lot of the hope I needed in small doses through that journey to keep it going. And then things keep coming and you get into tech stars. Yes. Why did you decide to go to an accelerator? Uh, I think, well, yeah, I mean, the tech stars, um, that was a bit at a time, to be honest, now that I'm actually reflecting, reflecting on this, um, that was a really hard time for us. Like we, we'd grown the business pretty, pretty quickly, in my opinion, um, on a bootstrap budget. Uh, we were, we were, we had a lot of the, the metrics that to me, I was really proud of, right. That I felt great. Like I, you know, the investor, the investment community has asked me to do these things. I feel as though I've done them. I've proven them. We have a vision. We can show traction. We 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 can show profitability, and we were still fate. We were still hitting this. Well, you're niche. You're small. Or you're going up against Amazon. Like you're never going. You're ne you're never going to be able to to beat those models. And um, and I really I, I had a lot of doubt at that time. And it was a bit of our kind of hail mary not as a business we were all we're always going to run our business but but could we be taken seriously in the startup world in the tech world um in the venture community as a business that can scale as you know trying to help people understand the power of distribution models and getting into tech stars was that vote of extra confidence we needed and i remember us sitting down as a team and saying like we're going to give this everything we've got and see if they can open the doors to the right people uh, who will believe in this and the big thinkers that don't doubt this vision and want to take on a food system. Um, and let's let's give it what we've got. And I remember thinking like, okay, and at the end of Techstars, if we really can't attract the kind of capital partners or larger strategic partners that we need, we should really rethink if we if we can do this nationally. And so. Um... So you use the word belief, which I think is an interesting word, um, because there's two things that, as a founder, um, you have to engender belief in. One is your belief in the company and externally articulating that belief so other people believe in the company. And the second is the belief in yourself. 
right? Can I, can I be the founder that I want to be? First time founder, female founder, working in ag tech, you know, which is not, is, is not software, right? It's not a B2B SaaS company trying to make big companies move faster. How did you, how did you engender the belief in yourself that you could achieve the things you wanted to achieve? I think I was calling you probably once a week. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of, I mean, I, that was, until I made the connect, it took me a while to make that connection. Like it took me, it took me a while to step back and say, maybe it is that simple, right? On the entrepreneurial journey that like, if you're start, if I'm starting to doubt myself, if I'm not celebrating the wins that we have, and if I'm really getting bounced around with all the feedback that I'm getting or the validation I'm not getting. Um, I'm kind of bringing that not only to my team and to my business and that that's reflect, that's reflecting everywhere. But I'm also bringing that into every conversation that I have um, with potential people who can make, you know, help make this happen for me. And I think until I really looked at that and said like, the work has to be done internally for a minute. And I, you know, until I, leaned into the mentors around me and understood that people have been through this before um, and can help you like on make that connection, help you bring it back to that thing that, that you have with you every day, which is you um, and do the self work. Like I really, it still to this day, it shocks me how much the performance of the company, um, the story that you're telling, the traction that you're getting everywhere is a reflection of, how you're feeling internally. Um, I think, you know, that's a lot of pressure and a lot of weight that in itself is sometimes overwhelming, but I, I, I still feel like I have a lot of work to do with, with really knowing that that is the truth. And you helped me really see that, you know, other mentors did as well. Um, yeah, and I know that's a bit of a fluffy answer, but something I have to think about every, every day, even as we're starting to scale and, and how hard and far I can feel from that sometimes. So let's, let's talk about scale. Uh, COVID hits. Uh, what's your first thought? Let's talk about COVID hits. What's the first thoughts that kind of hit your brain, both as a person and as a business owner? And then what was the reality? What actually happened? I haven't had a ton of time, even to be honest, to process um, in a way that I could really well articulate. So I guess I'll just walk you through this series of events and let you... <laughs> Uh, let you draw off the conclusions you will about what was going through my brain. Um, but so Techstars, we had our Boulder trip, which is really fun, obviously, you know, Techstars and Boulder is everything. So I was in my parents, my family lives in Denver. My mom, my great Midwest, Midwest mom met me at the airport with hand sanitizer and she had little kits for all the members of my team. Um, and started telling me what was going on in the news. And she was like, I think you're just gonna need these. Like just, they seem to be flying off the shelves with what's happening. And we took those and um, those become very important to us later, which is why I put so, so much emphasis on it right now. Um, and then I, I land in, back in Portland. Uh, this is at a time where we were doing two deliveries a week. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we were delivering. We were a team of five, like all, all five of us were doing all the deliveries, packing, customer service, everything. And we were working out of probably like 1,500 square feet, so a very tiny facility in the back of an old restaurant. And um, probably in a normal day, we were doing about 50 deliveries, you know, 100 a week, 150 a week. And I land on a Sunday, um, and that's when we'll, our batch closes, right? So Sunday at noon, we're like, okay, how many orders? are we going to send out for delivery on Tuesday and that week it was that day was 250 and I was like whoa we've over doubled how are we going to do this like it's crazy even to say these words in my mouth and we're doing like 2500 now a week um, and that was only 10 weeks ago but literally I just remember like the team we were just crushed like that felt nearly impossible we didn't even we weren't connecting the dots at this point like it just started happening and happening we figured you know we were working like 18 hour days just to get this 250 done delivered and then 650 hits for thursday and we are like oh my gosh like this is okay what are we gonna do i mean literally 
We were sleeping in our cars. It didn't dawn on us that we could even not, that we could ask to do deliveries another day or that we could cascade anything. We, had, we weren't thinking. Um, calling friends, farmers with vans and being like, A, do you have extra product? And B, can you show up on Thursday and we'll pay you to put stuff in your truck and deliver? Uh, great, great thing about the food industry is people are ready to rally quickly. And then we are just seeing these things start. I mean, it just, it was nonstop. Deliveries are coming in. Um, and, and of course, then we're understanding what's happening in the world. Um, and then, so that's a rush, right? As a, as a small business, all of a sudden, how are you going to keep your employees safe? How are we going to make sure that as we're doing this, we're delivering a safe and great experience? We had a lot of recyclables at the time. So we would pick up your milk bottles. We were doing all like um, drops into coolers and then bringing back a ton of plastic containers. Uh, we, were, we were starting to think about these things and immediately I was like, we, we can't do that anymore for our driver safety. So it's like getting on the phone, finding new packaging solutions and boxes. Um, and then the restaurant industry closed about a week later. And this is my community. These are my, like, these are, these are my friends. This is my family. Um, and they go out of business. And all of a sudden, first call I get is from one of our restaurant, or a friend of ours who's a restaurant distributor. And he says, I hear you're growing like crazy. I just lost my business overnight. And I just moved into a new uh, 6,500 square foot distribution facility that I can't make the rent for in two weeks. And I have 10 refrigerated vans and 10 drivers that I just laid off. Like, and I hear you're scaling. Do you need any of this? And can you pay me a little bit of money with that help? And I was like, yes. So literally I moved in the next day. We packed up the, the warehouse overnight. We moved in. Um, two days later, his crew was doing deliveries for us. We opened up four days a week delivery because we could. And then um, the farms start calling because they lost their, their, their channels overnight. And our business too, Rebel Meat Company, we were restaurant sales. And um, that's when it just, yeah, and still this day getting the calls, right? Uh, Seattle had just shut their farmer's markets. So all the farms we worked with in Seattle not only lost their markets, but, but their restaurants. Um, and we were like, we were selling out of everything, right? So I just called everybody and said, bring me everything you have. Like, we're going to figure out how to sell it. And then we said, how are we going to pack it? And I just sent a text out and we sat down as a team and we were like, we're calling in the cavalry, literally the words out of our mouths. And we just sent texts out into the community and said, if you've lost your job, please show up here in the morning at 7 a.m. wearing boots and hoodies because it's going to be where you're going to work in a cold room. Uh, 28 people from the restaurant industry showed up that day who just lost their jobs and like, and we were, we were just, it was mayhem. And we were like, we're going to get things into boxes and there's going to be a lot of farms showing up every day, figure out how to get it into a box. Um, and then we're just gonna be sending drivers out and our customers were extremely patient with us. I mean, it was, it was madness, but it never dawned on us that we weren't going to do this. I think it was probably about three weeks in where our leadership time, you know, team had time to sit down and say, okay, like, what are we doing? Can we do this, right? I mean, this is at a time where those hand sanitizer kits that my mom gave us were what we were, we, there was no hand sanitizer as a business, you know? And we just had to sit down as a team and we're like, okay, we have a lot of training, which is great. You, I run a USDA facility, so health and sanitation and SOPs around that is something we're trained in. So we replicated all those systems fast and we just sat down and said, we have two choices right now. Like, do we, do we hunker down as a business, conserve resources, um, and just ride this out at, and stabilize? Or do we sprint at the cliff? I think I even called you then. I called so <laughs> all the mentors. I was like, what do we do? Um, and we're like, well, even at the end of this, if in two months everybody goes back to the grocery stores and milk run crashes and we will have spent all this money, hired these people, and had no idea what we were doing and it's the end of milk run. Like if sprinting at the cliff through this and during a global pandemic, what we did was we banded together in the food community and brought as much food from farm, bought as much food from farms as possible and got it to as many people as possible. It will have been probably the most amazing thing we could have done. So let's just sprint at this cliff. Um, and that meant calling 
our friends at Cabinet Health that we were in Techstars with and saying, get us as much hand sanitizer as possible. And they were like, okay, you're going to need to buy 4,800 units direct from China. And I was like, okay. Um, and then just, yeah, we just sprinted at the cliff and the wheels didn't come off. Uh, actually, yeah, I mean, I say that like this because, you know, things fell off, sure. but the wheels didn't come off. Um, and our customers were so patient and so amazing. And then um, the team, like if you want to hire people to scale a business, hire the hardworking people out of restaurants and farms. I mean, it is running better and smoother, faster than I could ever imagine or have dreamed because of the talent, the cavalry and what they brought with us. Um, yeah. Or what they brought with them and, and brought to Milk Run. I mean, it's, it's truly nothing short of amazing. It's awesome. It's an awesome story. And, um, you know, it's, uh, as a former founder, I always get chills when I hear the, these stories because, um, you know, there are, there are two things that a founder faces that are exhilarating and scary. One is extreme growth and one is zero growth, right? Mediocre growth is the worst. So the fact that you sort of kicked it in and, and ran big is, is, uh, it's exciting. Um, where does that leave you now? Like what, what are your next big steps uh, for the business? Yeah, I'm just go back one minute, just from the founder perspective and share a story from one of my mentors, uh, Luke Cannies from Puppet. Um, I remember when he called me, um, he knew what was going on earlier, right? So he called me about a weekend and he said, Julie, are you ready? And I was like, am I, am I ready? And he was like, you are right now being faced with an opportunity very few CEOs and founders will ever have the opportunity to face, which is it's growth and stepping up and learning what you might have had previously years to learn in the next five days. Like brace yourself and be ready or, or not. You'll either rise to this occasion and force yourself to grow into that kind of CEO and founder or you won't. And it was the kick in the ass I needed, to be honest. But those words echo in my head every day. Um, and I just, that story came to me as you were just asking that. And what's next? Um, we also had to keep a very realistic view on everything um, as we went through this, right? Because there's the harsh reality too of uh, when, you're, when your business is doing well in a pandemic, that's challenging. And so for us, we made it a point to stay grounded and look at our growth plan and say, we're going to stay committed to doing what we've always planned on doing. This has just given us an opportunity to get there faster, but we need to, we need to stay grounded in the vision and in the plan that we have rolled out. And with that meant Seattle. We always, our goal had been to come to go and launch into the Seattle market. Um, granted that might have been later in the year, seeing the need and the demands made it possible for us to launch in the next few weeks uh, in Seattle, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so for us, you know, I think what's next is what we'd always intended on doing, which is launching into the Seattle market, proving our model is replicable, proving people in a larger city outside of kind of the food center and farm center area of Portland, Oregon is possible, is necessary. Um, I think we also learned a lot about what doesn't scale, which was really helpful. Um, we, you know, we have a very like a la carte model in Portland, but being able to talk to our customers so quickly and see what they wanted. And that's really to have core grocery staples delivered direct from farms reliably at the same, on the same day of the week every year, uh, which was great to hear because we were like, great, well, that level of complexity is not necessary then, right? We can actually do that better instead of like all of these different, we were losing a bit of focus before this. But growing really quickly helped us rein it in and say, okay, what do we do well? We aggregate from farms produce, meat, dairy, and fresh baked bread and eggs. Like that is what we do. We were trying to do way too many things before. And as we look at Seattle, how can we deliver that better, more reliably, and in a way that really lowers the operational complexity as we replicate and scale? And I'm, I mean, I think before I would have just spun around on those questions. And now I do understand when the investment community um, and VCs were asking me, what is your plan to scale? 
How do you simplify? How do you differentiate yourselves? Like, you're, yeah, those questions were harder for me to answer then because I don't think we were delivering that, right? But now I understand that and I'm committed to it. We can see it. I've been through it. Um, so it's just built a lot of conviction about the new merchandising model we'll be launching with Seattle. Uh, the subscription that our customers were asking for, which is great news for us because it's a great business model. Um, and then thinking through how we actually land in the new market, acquire customers, get farmers on board, and write down everything we're doing so that we're prepared to replicate. So one of the things that we try to do in these conversations is talk about tactical things yeah. that you've done as a business so that people can take away from that. And we have a list of questions that come in and I sort of try to pull from that. Um, I will pause to give a uh, space for anyone that has a question um, that maybe wants to ask it, that they get an opportunity to do that now. And if not, we'll just keep going. And feel free to just come off of, of a Zoom or a mute and ask it if you have one. I have something I'd like to- Go ahead, Jose. Um, before I go on, really nice to speak with you finally, Mika. I've been a fan of this for months. Julia, well done on your fantastic business plan. I'm in Norway. Um, a friend of mine who is Icelandic has done something quite similar and COVID has resulted in their curve just like going like this, if not like this. So with your permission, I would like the, to link the two of you up after this call because you're in different uh, different geographies, but you may have some synergies or something Something could connect as a result. So with your permission, I'll do that. Please, like the way I feel okay. about people who are working on getting more food from farms to people, there's, yeah. we're all allies in this. This is an okay. this is important. Then I'll mail you personally my email now and we can take it offline. Thank you, I really appreciate that. That's awesome to hear also. Congratulations, Tim. Uh, we got a question from uh, from David. Where does B two B play come into Milk Run as you go as you look forward as restaurants start to come back? Yeah, so I think you know it's important to know really Milk Run's differentiator. I mean, I look, I look at D two C as kind of like our Trojan horse, right? We started that way because it really gave us the margins that we needed um, to to fund our own growth. And, but ultimately, what is Milk Run? Milk Run is a platform for farmers to sell their products through and whether or not we deliver to the end consumer or to restaurants. So if we're, we've all, our experience is largely actually delivering to restaurants. We, all, we always have, we will always continue to. Um, schools or institutions, right? I mean, whoever that buyer is, we can end up serving, especially as we scale. And so that, I mean, the, the point of Milk Run has been to drive value for the farmers and make it easier. Uh, and so now, now we have the ability for restaurants to see that and we're their delivery partner uh, of choice for the farms. So that becomes, that has always been part of the plan, always will continue to be. One of the things that, and we've got about 15 minutes left, and I wanna be really careful of your time. Um, one of the things that we should definitely talk about before we, we end is it's been a difficult time over the last week and a half plus. Um, companies have had to make decisions about how they engage with their employees and their customers. Um, and, and some of those decisions have been difficult. I think some of them are easy, um, but some are very difficult. As a company that is young and growing rapidly, one of the things that happens often is culture becomes a difficult thing to focus on um, because you're just worried about getting that next order out the door. Um, you and I talked earlier this week about some of the things that you've been doing around the culture of the business. I'd love to hear your thoughts around culture, how you've managed that during this time period, um, and how you feel that that will apply as you start to scale the business nationally. I think it's incredibly even relevant to where we started the conversation, which is, you know, in the early days, me as a founder, like the, the health and the belief that I had um, internally, and it's direct was directly mirrored in the performance of us as a, you know, as a company and in the community. And now that we're scaling, that's true for us as a team, right? Like everything is a reflection as I'm learning about the health of us as a company, like the performance, even just the customer satisfaction, how quickly we can get product up that represents who we are. It's this constant now question of 
who are we? Who are we not? Who do we want to be? Um, and it really dawned on me this week, like you're saying, and we talked about, was I remember we, we uh, grew into our buildings. We got these offices that doing the walls really scared me for us. That's a business we're operational. And then we all of a sudden we're going to have these walls between people who spend time at a computer and spent and people who work in the warehouse. And I was like, okay, our job as a company, um, is to break these walls down, right? To make sure there isn't separation. And we're, we as founders uh, or the product types and or engineers, we can't build a product if we don't sit with our customers or sit with our product, which at the end of the day is produce and food. Um, so small things like physically knocking walls down um, became more and more important. Sitting down with everybody and saying, wow, we all just came together and 28 days ago, or you know, 30 days ago, 28 of us had different jobs. We need to sit down and introduce ourselves to each other. What do we have in common? You know, realizing that music is this common thread. So we're like, great, we are all working insane hours. We built a music room right in the center of our facility. Everyone brought their own favorite record. And that has just been this like gathering place and amazing just the impact that that had. Um, I remember walking into one of our new conference rooms and being like, okay, let's talk marketing. And the response I got was just dead. Like everyone was like, what? Like, you know, totally uninspired. It was one of the first times I felt that as a founder. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the most excited team of engaged, like excited individuals ever. How are they not, if they're not excited about marketing, I mean, what are we gonna do? And I was like, why, why is this so hard? And one of my team members said, well, you just made that feel like a job. We're just sitting in this white room now having to talk about marketing. And I was like, wow, that was our first step into something that was not our culture, right? Like that's, that's not who we are, that we're literally farmers and chefs. And I was like, okay, everybody outside right now, we're going out to the parking lot, which, you know, we, we sit now in the middle of the city with a barbed wire chain link fence around us, which has felt comforting. I don't know why, but it is. Um, so we're sitting in the parking lot and I was like, okay, great, cool. We need a whiteboard. We're surrounded by white vans. Great. What we do is we van board. So I just brought out the, the white, you know, dry erase markers. And I'm like, this is where we have our creative meetings now. And we write on vans. Um, and just having to like break apart those small things and say like, this is our now internal framework that came out of that meeting, um, which is who are we? Like we as a company, we need to walk into this building every day, stoked. That's the word we use because it reflects the language that we use every day. We're like, okay, our number one job here at Milk Run is to, to be stoked, be stoked about what we're doing, why we're doing it. And that's the only way, if we're not stoked, that we're going to get people stoked. And, and then if we, in order for us to get people stoked, we, and then we got to keep them stoked. And that's the only way, once those things in stages are done, then our customers are going to get other people stoked. Um, so we just said, like, it's as simple as that. If it was a language that we were all able to understand, and now, like, around the building, number one question you get asked every day is, are you stoked today? Like, let's get stoked. What are you stoked about today? Um, and it's so, it was so simple. It was, it was awesome. And like those small things, I never even as a founder, if you were to tell me like, what am I going to do when I build a company? I do. And talk <laughs> said that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, how big is the company now? Uh, we're 32. So it's still small, but big enough to step out of the, five people that are all in it together, you know, elbow to elbow. Um, how do you see as that company continues to grow, how do you, how do you keep that stokedness? How do you keep that culture going? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, even the question you and I were talking about yesterday, I think when sharing that story with people, like you or other mentors and hearing that what we're doing is establishing culture, like stepping back and being like, wow, uh, that, that felt casual and easy for us and like a Tuesday afternoon. But what we're doing is actually establishing culture. And this could be something like van boarding or how, like, or this mantra that we have in this framework, the music room, um, the shirts that we wear and the pins that we wear, um, the hats, the flat brims that we wear. Um, 
those small bits are it. Like I, you know, I think I would have missed that. I would have just treated that as something that was natural, but hearing, um, the word culture and, and intention and recognizing that for a second and, and realizing it can be that simple and that challenging, but to write those things down early, to put them and commit them to our playbook, to celebrate them and recognize them as unique to us and our company. Um, so we can continue to share them. I mean, I think I even am still trying to get into that rhythm and just recognize what we're doing here is building culture and sharing that um, and writing it down, capturing it and going out and testing that again and just staying committed to being stoked as our number one rule. That's awesome. Um, we'd love to hear too, and, and you know, it's nice that there's a little bit of, uh, you know, I have a little inside baseball so I can ask questions that maybe wouldn't normally ask. But um, I was really intrigued about uh, the implementation of your buddy system, uh, where you're actually trying to think about how to level, keep the company level rather than, than having it be come vertical. Um, you've implemented a system uh, that enables people to sort of cross train. Um, I'll let you describe it, but uh, yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think again, these walls, right? They really make me nervous. And in a business like ours, um, I've always talked about our differentiator being our DNA, and the fact that you know we're we're kind of from the industry that is now uh, what we're asking for is the support resources we need to build technology um, based on what we've experienced, right? As opposed to what I've seen or heard about a lot of the other approaches that companies in this sector have taken, which is, you know, a lot of people from maybe from the technology world, the venture community of the business world that have also seen this and then built systems and solutions and then went out and applied them to the real world and found it was harder than they originally thought to like get farmers on board, et cetera. So like I've always believed that was our value. And as we've, you know, as we continue to scale and we're building now a company that has silos, verticals, multiple people, you know, now people are kind of committed to certain things. It started to lose that. And I could even see it quickly, right? There were people who, um, you know, if you're not packing a box every day, but you're building product, that's a bit of a problem in a way, right? I mean, it's not, that's not your job, but like we as a company and a culture have to figure this out now so that as we scale and we hit the next step, we don't have this division and hit that same problem. Because in order to solve this problem, we need to understand it, we need to live it, and it needs to impact us. Like we have to touch the beats. We have to cut them up and put them in a pan. We have to put them in a box before we could ever build products or solutions around how to make that better. Um, so I think for me, I was, okay, great, buddy system. Like we don't need a hierarchy to do that. Actually, we need to stop focusing on climbing. We need to just focus on like how to continue to break down walls. We need, we need to focus on continuing to be connected here internally. Um, so as we started to need to train and we're actually, yes, like hierarchy is naturally happening because we're bringing in, you know, people and then other people are kind of doing higher level things. Um, I said, everybody needs a buddy. That's what we're calling people. Uh, your, your buddy's job is to take 30% of your tasks by the end of the week and be able to share those. And then everybody's buddy, everybody eventually got a buddy. Um, and it just became this ability for us to recognize other, and buddies are allowed to share one of the rules we have, right? You can be multiple people's buddies. It's important that you are, because it's based on skill set, right? We don't have to find people who are really good at packing a box. It's like, nope, we find people who are amazing at so many things and are just stoked to be here. And then we find small things that they want to be working on across multiple departments um, that they get to do every day, right? You don't want to sit and build a box every day. You, want to just, you don't want to just sit on a packaging line and put things in a box. You will lose your love and passion for things here. But that can be something you do for two hours of the day. And then another two hours, you're sitting in a Seattle Sprint talking about how we're going to acquire new customers. The other two hours, you're sitting with the product engineer, you know, the engineering team and testing product and sharing insights about the platform with them. And then the other two hours, you're out driving deliveries around so you can meet our customers, right? So you can, you can be celebrated and experience the moment when they come out and clap. Like, for me, that's the only way we will really deliver on our differentiation that I continue to talk about. Awesome. So as we as we wrap up, we come to our last few minutes here. I always like to ask the same questions of everybody. 
um, and it hopefully end this on a bit of a positive note. Uh, not that it has not been positive so far. I think it's been very positive. Um, what's the best thing that's happened to you this last week? It's been actually pretty, pretty, it wasn't an easy week. Um, but in the sake of ending this on a positive note, um, one of the things that one of the buddies said in the meeting the other day was uh, food waste, right? Like we need to help with some of the food that's being thrown away from some, some of this, the farms, right? On a larger scale, this is a huge issue. And so I was like, great, you're gonna be tasked with that. Um, we call him Moose, that's his name around here. So he, uh, he came, he, he said uh, yesterday, hey, Julia, I talked to one of our farmers, Randy Kiakawa, Kiakawa Orchards, incredible farm, check him out, Park, Parkdale, Oregon. Um, and he's like, I was calling some of our farms when he came to deliver, I was just talking about food waste or some extra stuff that they had. Um, Cause we kind of feel like maybe we're not doing enough, right? Um, to offer also like more inexpensive options to people or free food, we keep selling out of everything. Um, and he's like, so I was trying, trying, to, trying to find some product for us or anyway. And um, what Randy said was, I have four tons of apples that I don't, they're called Crimson Crisp. And I don't, they're not as crispy as the apples that I, I really like to send out to market. But they're beautiful. And I don't want to just send them to some cider company uh, either. That doesn't feel good. I, I want to figure out how to get them to people. And so, yeah, Moose came running up and he's like, Julia, I found four tons of apples that Randy needs out of his warehouse by Friday, <laughs> or he's going to have to send them to some cider company. He doesn't want to do that. And I was like, well, what do you want to do with them? He's like, I think I want to put them into bags. I want to make a video about maybe how to make apple pie or something really cool with some of the chefs here. And then I just want to give them away. Or maybe we could sell them for like $2 a bag, you know, people who normally don't get to, or can't afford food from milk run. And I was like, Great. So we are going to be launching that on Monday. We're going to pick up four tons of apples. Um, Moose gets to drive the truck because he hasn't been out to one of those farms yet. He's one of our new employees. So he gets to drive the truck. Um, we're going to go pick them up from Randy. Uh, we're going to shoot a little segment from Randy about why his apples aren't crisp enough and what that looks like for him. Um, and then we're going to bring him back here, film a cool video about what you can do with some just less than crispy, beautiful, amazing apples. And then we're either going to give them out or sell them for $2 a bag. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right. So we're going to, we're going to wrap up. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, so I'm going to give them back to your day. My gift to you is two more minutes to not do anything until your next meeting. Um, I greatly appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are and obviously uh, the business is exploding on you and, and managing that is a tough thing to do. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say in closing so I don't end on my voice? I know that it's, it's hard right now. I get it. I, you know, it's scary out there, but I guess if I can let people know right now something really positive that's happening, like farmers are back in business. I cannot even tell you, like it, I mean, I'm literally getting goosebumps right now just thinking about this, like people are buying food from farms directly right now in, in ways that no, I literally, I was sitting down with one of the older farmers who was just like beaming, who said, nobody has bought food from farmers at this volume in this way since I was a kid. Like, this is why I became a farmer. And like, I can't, it is working. I mean, the farms we're talking to right now, they're, they're buying more seeds from next year. We're starting microfinancing programs to help them do that. They're buying more, more steers, more, uh, more, more piglets, more, um, I can't even tell you, like farmers are back in business. They're scaling, they've heard it, they're responding. They feel so hopeful. The conversations with every farm right now, is how do we how do we plant more for you next year how do we make sure we have more garlic like i can't believe it farmers are busy they've been celebrated as essential they're wearing that badge they have heard it like everything everyone has done it wasn't a slow response they're responding they they've heard it it's made the biggest impact for me for my family for the farmers we work with for every farmer i know across the country like farmers are back in business thank you so much all of it has made a huge, amazing difference. Um, 
and yeah, and just stick with your farm, stick with your farmers, like please, <laughs> as, as, as we continue to, to march our way through this. Thank you so much, Julia. Appreciate the time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Andy to wrap it up. Um, Andy? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what a great session this was. Um, I really uh, appreciate your time, Julia, today. Uh, it was a bright point in my week um, and has really helped lift me up uh, in my emotional <laughs> state right now. So I am so grateful for you giving us that time um, and uh, allowing us to hear this story, uh, such a remarkable story, such a, a great tactical advice uh, about scaling and a reaction to scale um, and how I'm, I've already talked, sent your link over to a few people that I know in the food, food industry um, during the conversation. So I'm really excited to see where it goes and I can't wait for it to hit New York. Um, <laughs> really excited by that. So thank you again for your time. I put up um, all of our contact information, uh, Miha's contact, uh, Julia's contact information and my own. Um, so I encourage anybody who's on uh, the broadcast just to uh, reach out with any questions to any of us. Um, we're all here to help, we're all here to support. And again, one more time, a great thank you to Julia uh, for this time. And with that, we'll end the program and, and say thank you so much to everyone for giving us your time today. Have a good day. Thank you.